Hello and welcome to Real Cheating Story. I was sitting, enjoying my morning espresso at an outside table at Starbucks in Honolulu. Actually, it was a Vinny Java chip frappuccino, which is my favorite drink. The girls at the store start making me one as soon as I walk in the front door, I guess I'm a creature of habit. I do get a few dirty looks from people waiting in line when one of the girls walks down the line and hands me my drink with a pleasant, good morning, Mr. Mitchell. Of course, the tip may help. It was a typical Hawaiian day, not a cloud in the sky, the temperature in the mid-70s, and a mild breeze coming out of the west from the ocean. Actually, that's a dumb statement, Hawaii is an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. No matter what direction the wind is coming from, it's always off the ocean. I sat outside of my small table under a palm tree. The palm provided just enough shade so I was safe from a nasty sunburn. My driver, Keanu, and I enjoyed the peace and tranquility. I was trying to read the Wall Street Journal while he was checking his eyelids for light leaks. But today, my mind kept wandering back over the last five years. Yep, it's been five years since my wife divorced me and took off with her lover. I was living in western New York State at the time, working as a computer nerd for a large manufacturing company. I wasn't the greatest tech employee there, in reality, I was a little lower than average. I didn't even try hard, I guess I wasn't the most ambitious rep they employed. To be exact, if I finished one job, I would just wait until the next job was assigned to me instead of looking for more work. I tended to hide a lot. As normal, I was surfing the web after finishing my last assigned task when my supervisor walked into my cubicle. He said the department manager wanted to see me. This was an unusual request, and I felt just a little apprehensive. We walked to the elevators together to visit him. When my supervisor and I reached the big boss's office, Margaret, his secretary, asked us to take a seat. I believe she said, Mr. Martin is on the phone and will see you shortly. Shortly turned out to be almost 30 minutes, the longest 30 minutes of my life. When we were finally escorted into his office, we weren't even offered a chair. Jim, that's me, he started. You have been an employee of this company for, he stopped to look at some paperwork on his desk. Fifteen years. I regret to inform you that your services are no longer required here. You will receive one year's severance, all your accrued vacation, and personal time in your next paycheck. Well, that was it. I was fired. What the hell was I going to do now? I was too old to start all over again. What the hell was I going to tell Shalia, my wife? I thought as I packed my belongings in a box. I'm not really sure what the next couple of hours contained, but I found myself sitting in a bar, having a double, actually, my third or fourth double, when the bartender suggested that I had had enough and it was time to go home. I drove carefully home, no use getting a DWI arrest, I thought. I pulled into my garage and promptly drove partially through the rear wall. I guess my wife had some work done today that involved shortening the garage. Well, the noise should have brought her out to the garage, but it didn't. When I finally got to my feet and tried the door to the house, I found it unlocked. I opened the door to a completely empty kitchen. The table and chairs were gone, but even worse, all the kitchen appliances were also missing. The first thought entering my foggy mind was, we've been robbed. I staggered into the living room, and everything was gone. The room was as bare as it was when we first bought the house. My head was still a little slow, and I never noticed the pile of my stuff in the middle of the living room floor. I carefully climbed the stairs to the bedroom area and found everything missing, well, not everything, all my clothes and stuff were thrown in a pile on the bedroom floor. The pile stunk. After a while, I realized that the smell was urine. As I got closer to the pile, the smell got stronger and stronger. In my drunken state, I vomited to culminate my day. I hit my clothes, went downstairs, and curled up on the carpet. I won't claim that I fell asleep, I think I just passed out. When I awoke the next morning, I had the world's biggest hangover. My head throbbed, my mouth tasted as if an army had marched through it, and my body was stiffer than a board from sleeping on the floor. 
I stumbled out to the garage and noticed my wife's car was gone. I staggered back to the kitchen, planning on fixing some coffee, if there was any left. There wasn't. She took that too. It took a few minutes for my brain to engage a little more before I saw the note on the counter. I picked it up and started reading. Jim, we have been married almost 14 years. In that length of time, you have turned out to be a loser. You are not a good husband, a good provider, or a good lover. You are selfish and thought only of your wants and needs. I have moved my stuff out and into my lover's house. I will be contacting a lawyer to start divorce proceedings. Sheila. Well, I guess I knew where today was going. Sheila was a legal secretary for a large law firm. I suspected that she was planning to upgrade to one of the attorneys, as well as use the firm to gut me. Thank God we didn't have children. I was a little pissed, so I looked for the house phones. They were all gone. I still had my company cell phone. They forgot to ask me for it. So, as a final act of defiance, I called the bank and reported that I had been mugged last night and that my wallet was stolen. A very helpful young lady froze all my credit cards and my checking and savings accounts. My debit card was stolen too. After I got off the phone, I was smiling. Boy, was Sheila going to be pissed when none of our joint cards worked. I packed my things into my car and took all the luggage. I couldn't even find any garbage bags. She took everything. One of the reasons my favorite watering hole was my favorite was that it was owned and operated by my best friend since childhood, the one person I trusted with my life. So I went to his bar for advice. Bartenders always give the best advice. Besides, he had an ex-wife and might know a good divorce attorney. There was also the problem of hiding my final check. I didn't want Sheila to get it. Martin poured me a double as I walked into the barroom. After last night, I figured you could use one, he stated with great sympathy. I downed the glass in one gulp. He looked at me in shock, I really didn't drink that way. So I told him my story from when I left his bar last night. When I got done, I had the name of his divorce attorney, an apartment over the bar, and an IOU equaling the amount of my severance check. He was going to include the check in one of his banking deposits and just steal out the money as I needed. Time went on, and so did my divorce. A year later, I found myself divorced and living in a small one-bedroom apartment in a questionable neighborhood. My loving wife had hired a shark for a lawyer. Hell, she worked for the firm, and I was cleaned out. She got the house, the 401k, the investment account, and the checking and savings accounts. However, she almost got alimony payments, but since I had no job or money, the judge took pity on me and forgave them. Ha! Huh. I still had the severance check. No one on her legal team thought to ask about it. It might sound as if my ex made out, but the house was upside down on the mortgage. The savings account had less than $1,000 in it. The checking account was almost empty from paying the monthly bills with no deposits, and the newly started 401k had less than $22,000 in it. And best of all, in my opinion, was the fact that most of the joint credit cards were near their max. It seems Sheila went on a spending spree before the divorce was final. I guess she planned on sticking me with the bill since I had no income at the time. The judge stuck her with them. I think it took a week to get the smile off my face. Eventually, I had to get a job. I wound up as a janitor in the school system, working the night shift. My days consisted of either sitting at my computer or sitting at my friend's local bar. Guess what I did with my free time? When at the bar, I was on my way to becoming an alcoholic. One morning, I found a Powerball ticket in my pocket. I didn't remember buying it, but I did remember that the bar I favored sold them. I tossed the ticket on my desk and went to the bathroom. I did the three S's and started my morning coffee. I needed that wonderful elixir to feel human in the morning. Well, actually, it was 1 p.m., but that was morning to me. When I got out of the shower, I waited for my PC to boot up. I noticed the Powerball ticket beckoning me, so once the PC started, I fired up Firefox and went to the Powerball site. I checked the numbers on the ticket three times. They matched the winners. I reread the web page. 
there was only one winning ticket sold, and it was worth $250 million. That's millions, folks. I grabbed a pen and quickly signed my name on the back of the ticket. My next item of business was to call the lawyer who represented me in the divorce. I got his answering machine, it was a Sunday. I left a detailed message asking him to call me. Two hours later, he called back. I guess he didn't have anything going on this Sunday either. I explained my win, and I made an appointment for Monday. The next day, we had a very long discussion about trusts, investments, tax avoidance, and, most importantly, that my ex was not entitled to anything. It took almost a month to set up all the hidden bank accounts and take possession of the money. Two weeks later, I was looking at property in Hawaii. I wanted a fancy place on one of the hills near Hawaii Kai, a suburb of Honolulu. It took almost a year before I had the new place set up to my liking, but now I was finished and enjoying the good life. My favorite memory of this period was when I got a call from my lawyer. It seemed that my ex-wife wanted to talk, she had heard about my winnings. My lawyer shot her down. I knew there was something I liked about him. So there I was, sipping my frappe and enjoying my thoughts when I felt something. Did you ever have one of those funny feelings that you were being watched? I started to alert my driver, he was also my bodyguard, when I looked around and spotted a little girl of about five or six standing there watching me. She had long dark hair and the prettiest blue eyes I had ever seen on a child, but they were very sad eyes. She had a small doll clutched to her chest and a small blanket under her nose. She tore at my heart, and I wanted to just hug her and make all her problems go away. I looked at her and gave her my friendliest smile, there was no sense in frightening her with a dirty look. At the same time, I looked for a hovering parent. No parent I knew would ever let their child wander around strangers. I widened my search, still nothing. I got the attention of one of the counter girls, and with some improvised sign language, I asked, Who is she? I watched as she asked the other counter girls, and all I received in return for my efforts was a shrug of her shoulders. By now, I had attracted the attention of a couple of women sitting around the courtyard. As I surveyed them, they all shook their heads, No. By now, the little girl was scared, there were tears dripping from her eyes. I gave her my best smile and handed her my clean handkerchief. She took it and just stood there with it in her hand. I took her little hand and dried her eyes. For my efforts, I got a small smile and a dirty handkerchief. A couple of the women walked over to me and started talking to her. One of the women pulled out her cell phone and dialed 911. I heard her talk to the operator about a lost child. When she hung up, she turned to me and said, Five minutes. The little girl started making small noises, so I started running my fingers through her hair. I gave her a soft little kiss on the top of her head. She looked at me and said, Grazie, Papa. It had been 20 years, but I recognized the phrase. It was Italian for thank you, grandfather. You see, in the late 1980s, I was stationed in Italy courtesy of the U.S. Army. I picked up quite a bit of Italian while I was there, if a guy wanted to get close and personal with one of the bar girls, speaking the language was necessary. This little girl was speaking Italian. Bella, ciao. E-I-O Jim. Hi, beautiful. My name is Jim, I said. I saw her eyes light up, and a great big smile crossed her face. She hugged me tighter. Bella, what is your name? beautiful. I asked next. Bella, she answered. Well, I tried a couple more times but got nothing different, so I decided to try another direction. Aqua, I asked. I got a little smile, so I took her hand, and into the Starbucks we went. While we were looking at the cold drink cooler, one of the baristas whipped up a small caramel frappuccino and gave it to Bella. One sip, and Bella was hooked. She gave the girl a big smile and said, Grazie. A polite child. We walked back out to my table, and Bella sat next to me and slowly drank her treat. I spotted the Honolulu police cruiser pull up at the curb and waved at the officers. 
They walked over to me and asked what was going on. I explained that Bella appeared to be either lost or abandoned. One of the officers started talking to Bella. He was nice and polite, but he was speaking English. I could see the frustration building in his face when his partner noticed the smile on my face. Okay, do you know why she won't talk to us? He asked. I nodded my head. It appears that she only speaks Italian. My Italian is about 20 years old, so I can't get a lot out of her. Do you guys have anyone who speaks the language that you can call? Bathroom? She asked. I motioned to one of the women sitting around the patio, pointed at Bella, and said, Bathroom. One of them came to my rescue, but Bella wouldn't go with the woman, so the three of us made the trip. I stayed out in the hall. Bella called me a couple of times just to make sure I was still there. When we got back to the table, I was informed that the police could not find anyone to speak Italian, so they called Child Protective Services, and a caseworker was coming. Two hours later, the two cops, Bella, and I went to McDonald's for lunch. Bella knew exactly what she wanted and, by pointing, made her choices known. I bought lunch for the four of us. When we got back to Starbucks, a very angry caseworker was waiting for us. She started writing on the police officers. She bitched at them about wasting her time by forcing her to wait for us. Well, they weren't about to take any from her, so a shouting match started. Bella was getting scared, so I walked her away from all the noise. The caseworker saw me and started yelling that I was kidnapping the child and that I should be stopped. I pulled out my cell phone and started making calls. I had been a large contributor to the current governor's campaign fund. My thought process was that if I had given all that money, I might as well start getting a little benefit from it. I got one of the governor's underlings on the phone, explained who I was and what my problem was, and the reply was, I'll take care of it. It took about five minutes when the caseworker's cell phone rang. She answered it very rudely and started yelling at whoever interrupted her when suddenly she got very quiet. All I heard was a lot of yes from her end of the conversation. While she was listening, an unmarked police car pulled up. I recognized the man getting out of the car. It was the chief of police. He walked up to his officers, and they went into conference. He then walked up to the caseworker and said, Hang up the phone, get in your car, leave, and that's an order. If you fail to obey, I'll have you arrested. The caseworker left, and the chief walked over to my table with his two officers and introduced himself. Did either of my officers act in any way discourteous during their interactions with you? He asked. No, sir. They were very polite and helpful. They are working to find a translator so that we can help the girl, I said. The two uniformed patrolmen smiled at me. The chief sat down at my table and we started discussing little Bella. The two officers returned to patrol duty and the chief and I tried to decide what to do with my newfound friend. We decided that Bella would stay in my house until they found her parents or other relatives and they would try to find an Italian translator. My driver had returned to my house. He wanted to do a little yard work so I called home and requested pickup. We were going to be very busy that afternoon buying Bella a wardrobe of little girl clothes, so it was off to Ala Moana Mall for an afternoon of shopping. My driver's wife was also my housekeeper and cook, so I asked if he could bring her along to help pick out Bella's outfits. Keanu, my driver, and his wife, Alani, showed up about 15 minutes later. Alani spent the whole trip to the mall quizzing me all about Bella. When we got to the mall, the girls visited all the children's stores while Keanu and I just made trip after trip back to the car with packages. If I remember correctly, we visited the Disney store, Gap Kids, Jim Marie, Janie and Jack, Pitter Patter, and the children's place. We didn't exactly buy something in every store, but it wasn't for lack of trying. My American Express got a real workout. Bella and Alani became the best of friends. They chattered back and forth to each other, neither understanding what the other was saying, but that didn't stop them. They shared the universal language of women shopping, that's all they needed. I don't remember which store was selling children's bedroom furniture, but both of them stopped and stared at all the little girls' bedroom items. We didn't go into that store, thank God, 
but I had a feeling we would be back another time. By the time we finished buying out the mall, it was too late to cook dinner, so I was elected to buy everyone their meal. I had a brainstorm and selected Annie's Pastas on South Biltanya Street in downtown Honolulu. I figured that I might find someone who spoke Italian there or at least get directions to someone who did. I mean, let's face it, it was an Italian restaurant. No one was around that spoke Italian, but the owner promised to keep an ear open for a native speaker. He was fourth-generation Italian, and all his Italian-speaking relatives had long since departed this earth. But the food was good, and Bella had pizza, like all kids. For a little kid, Bella ate almost the whole thing. It was getting late when we left the restaurant. I think that before we reached the freeway H1, there were two sleeping people in the back seat, Bella and her new friend Alani. Shopping takes a lot out of you. Keanu and I unloaded all the bags into one of the spare bedrooms. Alani and I put Bella into the bedroom right next to mine. Alani picked out a pair of Disney pajamas for Bella and helped her get cleaned up and dressed for bed. After Keanu and Alani left for home, I decided to have a small drink before calling it a night. As I sat on my lanai watching the stars, I heard a small voice calling, Poppy. I walked into the house and found a little girl huddled in a corner, softly crying. It broke my heart. I picked her up and carried her out to my chair. She cuddled up as she sat on my lap and soon was back to sleep. We spent the night in the lounge chair. Boy, was I stiff the next morning. Alani woke us up the next morning, wondering what we wanted for breakfast. I looked at Bella and said, Manja. Eat. She jumped up and grabbed Alani's hand, and the two of them headed for the kitchen. Soon, I was served a cup of coffee by a very proud little girl. She chattered away to me as if I knew exactly what she was saying. I helped her set the coffee cup on the table so that we wouldn't get any spills. She stood there and watched me with the coffee. It took a few seconds before all the gray cells in my head realized that she was waiting for me to sip my coffee. I did, and with great exuberance, said Pareto. I was rewarded with an ear-to-ear -ear grin. I noticed that Alani was standing in the doorway, watching. She smiled at me and said, Way to go, boss. Now go take a shower and get cleaned up while Bella and I prepare breakfast. One thing I learned at my mother's knee, obey all commands given by a female or you'll regret it. So I headed for my bathroom. As I was finishing dressing, a little voice said, Poppy, prima cena, breakfast. When I opened my bedroom door, there she was, waiting for me. She took my hand and escorted me to the kitchen. There, I found the table set with my finest china. On closer examination, I noticed that the silverware was set in a very haphazard manner. I looked at the little one and gave her a big thumbs up. This time, along with my smile, I also got a hug. After breakfast, I got on the phone and started calling in favors and other forms of blackmail. I was looking for a translator. As much as Bella was growing on me, I knew that somewhere someone was looking for her. She was just too precious a little girl. I think I should stop for a second and tell you about my estate. When I bought the property, there was a small in-law house behind the main house. Since I didn't have any in-laws, I rented the house out to vacationers for monthly periods. My estate was in a gated compound with all the necessary security, so the rent was high. Because of the security, location, and the ridiculous rent I charged, I got people who were famous and wanted privacy. My current tenants were no exception, they arrived last night, and I had yet to meet them. All I knew was they were a husband and wife with a small child, and she was the main breadwinner with a job in national news. Bella and I were enjoying our breakfast when we heard, Excuse me, could I borrow some milk for coffee and our Cheerios? Now I knew that between renters, we tossed out any leftover food. With the humidity, nothing lasted very long. I smiled at him and said, no, but you guys must join us for breakfast. I know there is nothing to eat over there. Please join us, we have plenty of food and would love the company. After a few false starts, he agreed. He went back to the guest house for his wife and child. 
When they returned, we introduced ourselves and sat down to one of Alani's fabulous meals. Since I was ahead in the food department, I explained about Bella. My goal was to see if they knew any Italian speakers. They didn't, but our news anchor paid very close attention to my tale. We were even enjoying coffee from my cured coffee maker. Alani had brought out a selection of coffees, teas, and some hot chocolates for the kids. My guests had a good time inspecting all the choices. My house phone started ringing. Alani answered it, and after a short chat, handed me the phone. Good morning, I started in a very formal voice. Please hold for the ambassador. Then they put me on hold. The next voice I heard was a very pleasant male with a slight Italian accent. Mr. Douglas, I'm the ambassador to the United States for my government. I understand that you have found a child of one of our citizens. Yes, sir, and I need some help with her. I went on to explain Bella's discovery and everything we had done so far to help her. He listened politely until I was finished, then asked if he could speak to her. I handed the phone to Bella. Pronto, she began. For the next 30 minutes, she listened and occasionally replied with a C or some rapid Italian I couldn't quite translate. Finally, she handed me back the phone. The ambassador highlighted their talk. It seemed that Bella only knew of her life with her kidnappers. She did not know her mother or father, her real name, her age, or her birth date. She was kept chained in small rooms as she grew from an infant. Her food was put in metal bowls on the floor of whatever room she was kept in. She was never allowed out of her room and was not allowed anything to wear but the shift that found her in. She was only ever called girl. That was the only name she ever knew. The ambassador indicated he was sending a representative of his government to delve into her history. He also indicated that his people had checked me out, and it was decided that Bella would remain with me until her fate was determined. The ambassador's representative would be flying out in three days and would be staying with Bella at my home, if that was agreeable. He said it was very agreeable to both Bella and me. I spent the next hour answering questions from everyone at the breakfast table. When they finally ran down, the chief of police showed up. I went through the morning's events with him. Somehow, it was decided that Bella needed a little girl's bed. Guess who was volunteered to buy one? Keanu brought the car around while Alani dressed Bella. Somehow, my renters were invited along to see the mall. I knew the husband didn't relish spending one of his vacation days shopping, so with very little effort, I talked him into spending the date at the golf course. We all fit into my Bentley with room to spare. I drove the car to the mall while Keanu dropped off the husband at the golf course. Bella recognized the mall, and when I explained that we were going to buy her a bed of her own, she cried tears of joy. She dragged me to the store where she saw the pink bedroom set yesterday. Now, Ala Moana Mall is a big place, but Bella navigated it to that store without a single error. When she grows up, she'll be one heck of a shopper. Bella didn't understand all the ins and outs of shopping, but she was learning fast. All she knew was that she wanted the pink bed and the great big teddy bear to go with it. I handed Alani my gold card, and they left with the sales lady to pick out sheets, pillows, and all the other things Bella needed to establish her own room. Everything we purchased was to be delivered and set up by 5 p.m. that day. Bella would sleep in a real bed tonight, her own bed. We were a happy group, so we stopped at the food court for junk food and ice cream. Bella was overwhelmed. She had never seen anything like the food court. She wanted to try everything, but Alani put the kibosh on that idea. I guess I didn't mention that Alani was a health food addict. Junk food was not in her dictionary. Still, Bella managed to get some junk food. That kid could charm the socks off anyone. It was 3 p.m. when we arrived home and found a large furniture truck waiting for us. Bella's new bedroom had arrived. The movers had most of the items off the truck, and they were sitting in front of the garage waiting for us. Bella was so excited that she walked up to the biggest mover and started jabbering away in Italian. The two of them entered the house hand in hand, with Bella leading the way. 
she took him right to the bedroom next to mine and started pointing to the existing furniture. As she pointed to a piece, she would act it out, demonstrating how it fit into the next empty room. The movers loved it. Before long, they were a perfectly coordinated team, the guys carting and Bella directing. It took until 6 p.m., but the guys got everything set up. I walked the two men out to their truck and gave each man $100 as a tip. At first, they refused the money, explaining that Bella was worth their time and I didn't need to tip them, but I prevailed. Bella, Alani, and my renter went to work putting Bella's stuff into the various drawers and storage items. When we purchased her clothing, it looked like a lot, but when it was all put away, the drawers were painfully empty. I knew there would be a lot of trips back to the mall in my near future. I sent Keanu out for food for the golfers, and Bella gave me a tour of her new room. The big teddy bear was in the middle of her bed, and in its arms was her little doll. Bella walked over to the bed and pointed at the big bear, saying, Poi. Then she touched the little doll and said, Bella. I just stood there with tears running down my cheeks. Bella reached into the pocket of her dress and pulled out my handkerchief from yesterday. She pulled me down on my knees and started drying my cheeks. That night, I wore pajamas to bed in case I got a visitor in the middle of the night. I got a little visitor, this time she wasn't scared. She was happy and wanted to cuddle. Toward the end of the week, I received an email from the Italian embassy. It contained the flight number and arrival time of Bella's tutor. Bella, Keanu, and I were standing in the arrival lounge when Miss Gina Castillo walked through the gate. She was stunning, dark hair, olive skin, dark eyes, and about 5 feet 6 inches. I've never been good at guessing a woman's weight, but her body was perfect. She was dressed in a business suit that highlighted her attributes, in my humble opinion. We went through the greeting routine among the adults, and when everyone was introduced, Gina squatted down and introduced herself to Bella in Italian. The two of them must have chatted for at least five minutes. When Gina finally stood back up, Bella was holding her hand. I felt a twinge of jealousy, but Bella pulled Gina over to me and took my hand in her free one. We walked out of the airport with Bella between us, holding our hands. We walked to the baggage claim area, where Gina pointed out two small bags. Not a lot of clothes, I thought. I hoped she was having the rest of her stuff shipped. When we arrived home, Keanu put her luggage in one of the spare rooms. Bella gave Gina the grand tour of the house, ending with Bella's bedroom. It was a busy afternoon. Bella and Gina spent until Bella's bedtime just talking, even through dinner. The two of them disappeared into the rear of the house, and about an hour later, they reappeared. Bella had on pajamas, and Gina wore a long house coat. They both had that fresh scrubbed look. Bella kissed me goodnight and said something to Gina. Gina laughed and said, Bella wants to know if you're still going to tuck her in bed or will you be tucking me in instead? I guess my jaw dropped open. Bella said something to Gina, and Gina started laughing again. Bella wants to know if it's still alright to climb into bed with you if she gets scared, or will I get mad at her? I guess she thinks we'll be sleeping together. I couldn't believe my ears, and for a moment, I was mute. Gina just smiled. Out of the mouths of babes, I thought. I took Bella's hand and walked her into my bedroom. I pointed at my side of the bed and said, Poi, pointing at the other pillow I said, Bella. I was rewarded with an ear-to-ear -ear smile from my very happy little girl. Bella looked at the bed and started pointing, Poppy, Bella, indicating which pillow was for each of us. I looked over at Gina, who was just enjoying the whole conversation. Okay, explain your thoughts, I challenged. Gina just looked at Bella and said something in Italian, which I couldn't understand. After I got Bella all tucked in, I went looking for Gina. I found her on the lanai, waiting for me with a glass of wine. I fixed myself a crown royal on the rocks, a strong one. We've got to talk. I learned a lot about Bella today. Damn right we do, I replied, feeling irritated. I was just having fun with you. You really need to loosen up a little. 
First and most importantly, Bella has never had any education or mother-child bonding. She was left to raise herself. Her language skills are about equal to those of a four-year-old. She has never been taught any personal hygiene and has never been shown any affection in her whole life. Well, her language skills aren't that far off. I figured she's five or six, I replied. Sorry, but as near as I can tell, she's around ten or eleven. Gina then told me about her qualifications. She was a child philologist educated in Rome and Switzerland. She explained that Bella was a blank slate we could mold into a productive member of society if I wanted to help. Gina went on to tell me all about her afternoon with Bella. This is your home, but Bella refers to it as if it's both of yours. You need to be very careful how you refer to it around her. I was still stuck on Bella's age. Next, I will start teaching her English, she continued. As soon as her English improves, I want you to start reading to her at bedtime. It will not only help her English but will also help her learn affection. We need to replicate all the personal interactions a child would have during their early years. I can do that, I said proudly. The next thing we need to do is demonstrate affection between adults. By that, I mean simple things like hand-holding, simple kissing, hugging, and affectionate touching. Sounds like you have a lot of work laid out for us. How long will you be staying, and will your husband or boyfriend object? I asked. I have no one in my life at present, and as for how long, we'll play that by ear. Get a good night's sleep. You should have your friend join you when she gets lonely, she continued. I must have looked at her funny because she added, not me. Bella. Over the next couple of weeks, our renter, or news lady, spent a lot of time with Bella and Gina. When Gina told her not to work on a story just yet, she was just being protective of Bella. The next few days were crazy around the house. First, there was the arrival of Gina's stuff. The UPS guy made at least five trips with his handcart. I knew women liked clothes, but this was ridiculous. With Bella's help, she managed to get everything unpacked and either stored in her closet or in the dresser. I did get a laugh at some of what they sent. There were winter clothes and a set of skis. In case you don't know, it very rarely gets below 65 degrees. The tall volcanoes may get an occasional few inches of snow, but there aren't ski lifts, and there's not much call for cold weather outfits. It seemed as if Bella and Gina were joined at the hip, wherever you saw one, the other was right next to her. I began to see a method in Gina's madness. When Bella asked a question, Gina answered it in English first. Then, if Bella didn't understand, Gina went back and slowly answered it again, this time explaining the English words in Italian. I began to notice that Bella was accepting the English answers more often than not. The next big surprise was when the UPS man arrived with boxes of school books. Bella was to start her adventure into homeschooling, and she took to it like a fish to water. She and Gina set up a small classroom in one of my spare bedrooms. They spent at least four hours in the morning, broke for lunch, did some girl things, and then, if time permitted, worked the rest of the afternoon before dinner. If Gina wasn't handy, I was given the chance to answer Bella's school questions. Bella tried to talk to me in English when she asked the question, under pain of death from Gina, I was required to answer in English. Bella had an Italian-English dictionary with her, and during these times, I could judge if my answer was over her head by the amount of page-turning that was going on. Two months had gone by, and I was really impressed with Bella's progress and Gina's skills. One morning at breakfast, I was interrupted by a phone call from Washington, D.C. It was the Italian ambassador. It seems we were the darlings of the morning news shows. My render did a special on Bella child kidnappings, and our success with saving her. There was Bella, smiling from ear to ear, holding Gina's hand in mine, Bella at Starbucks, Bella at the mall. We had a long conversation, the core of which was, of course, Bella and her safety. The Italian government could find nothing about Bella, no parents, no siblings, nothing. Unless someone stepped forward to adopt her, she was headed for an Italian orphanage. 
I didn't even have to stop and think. I just said, of course I will. The ambassador just laughed. I knew you would, but I had to ask. He said he would make all the necessary arrangements. His next statement floored me. What about Gina? Her being available will cease when you adopt Bella. He stated that she was attached to the embassy. Bella would be heartbroken if Gina left. Can we get her a work visa? Then I could pay her as a tutor. I like having Gina around, eye candy and all that. Besides, I like our chats. Talk to her and let me know, was all he said. That night, Gina and I had what was to be the first of many talks. I told her about my decision to adopt Bella to prevent her from ending up in an orphanage. Well, I had always heard that Italian women had terrible tempers. Gina proved that to be a fact. She read me the riot act. I guess I struck a nerve. She yelled that while my intentions were good, I was a stupid pig. Actually, she used a much stronger adjective describing what I sat on, and she wasn't referring to a chair. When she finally calmed down, we discussed the adoption into the wee hours. We left it at that it was Bella's decision. I knew I would be heartbroken if Bella didn't choose me. Gina was quiet around me for the next month, and I walked on eggshells. One morning, when Keanu and I were returning from coffee, we were met at the door by Gina and Bella. Bella ran up to me and hugged me with all her might. Gina threw her arms around my neck and gave me a kiss. I guess I did something right, but I'll be damned if I knew what. When Gina finally gave me my lips back, she said, You are a wonderful man. The ambassador called today. The papers are being FedExed to us. What papers? I never claimed to be the sharpest pencil in the box. Don't you try to fool me. I know you plan everything, adopting Bella and sponsoring my visa so I could stay here with you, too. That night, there were two sweet females in my bed. Bella was in her usual spot, and Gina was spooned against my back. Damn, I got a really good sleep. The next morning, I woke to poking. Gina was gently prodding me. It was a nice way to wake up, too bad Bella was wrapped around my back. I could have stayed that way all day. As I wiggled my way out of bed, I heard not one but two females complaining. I went to the bathroom, got undressed, shaved, and hopped in the shower. About halfway through, I felt a draft. Gina had drawn back the curtain and was inspecting me. Not bad, was all she said before leaving. I started to protest her departure, but then I heard Bella's voice. I decided that I'd start researching summer camps for Bella, that way, I could get some alone time with Gina. It was a nice idea but I found that there weren't any overnight summer camps around. The next couple of years just flew by. Bella accepted Gina and me as her parents. I really don't know when or how it happened, but one day I noticed that we were mommy and daddy when she referred to us. Gina and I grew closer. While I was still shy as far as marriage was concerned, that didn't stop me from allowing her to move into my bedroom. Bella even stopped visiting us in the middle of the night. Gina and I started taking afternoon naps when Bella was in school, just in case we got a little visitor in the middle of the night. As part of Bella's development, she started going to school with her peers. She did great, she blended in with her age group, and we had kids visiting the house almost every day. Our house became the neighborhood hangout. Every weekend, Bella had a couple of her friends sleep over. Alan loved the kids, her grandchildren lived in California and these were her substitute grandchildren. One day, I asked her if taking care of all the children was too much for her. I know Italian women have a temper, but I never realized that Hawaiian women did, too. And to make matters worse, Hawaiian women were really good with knives. One of these days, I'm going to learn to keep my mouth shut. One Sunday, Bella sat on my lap to chat. Poppy, what are you going to ask mommy to marry you? You know she loves you very much, and you love her too. Besides, I want a baby sister or brother before you're too old. A lot of thoughts crossed my mind in a few seconds. The one that ended up in the forefront was, why not? So I asked Bella, if you can keep a secret, 
you and I will go looking at rings after school tomorrow. When I picked her up the next afternoon, she had a list of all the jewelers on the island she wanted to visit, all of them. What Bella wants, Bella gets. She and I spent the next couple of weeks shopping. It was the usual conundrum. We ended up back at the first shop we had looked at. The ring we chose was a simple diamond surrounded by small cut birthstones. They were Bella's, mine, and hers. The jeweler said he could add more birthstones if we had more children. It was simple but elegant. Bella approved, and I paid. The next thing Bella did was plan how I was to propose. She told me, you are the best dad, but you don't understand women. I'll plan the proposal. And plan she did. She and Alani worked out all the details for a special dinner, choosing the date that Bella found me at Starbucks. That sounded good to Gina, a special dinner on the day that our little Bella joined me. Alani did her usual excellent job of preparing and serving the meal. We were having a very relaxed dinner when Alani served dessert. On Gina's plate was only the ring box. She just sat there with tears running down her face, still not opening the box. Bella broke the silence. Well, aren't you going to open it? Gina just sat there, shaking her head and crying. She made no move to open the box. Bella just looked at me and said, Well, ask her. So I did. Gina, will you make me the happiest man in the world and marry me? I know it wasn't an elegant speech, but I'm not that good a speaker. At that point, Bella put her two cents in, say yes so you can start making me a brother or sister. Gina picked the box up and held it in very shaky hands, saying, yes, yes, yes. The women went crazy for the next three months. They decided on the location for the wedding, the park at Y, and they even got a Catholic priest to officiate the outdoor ceremony. The reception was to be at my country club, where there would be about 200 guests. The bridesmaid was to be Bella, and the best man was to be Keanu. The rest of the wedding party was to be our friends. Some of Gina's friends worked for the Italian embassy in Washington, and they were invited, all expenses paid. Gina's parents had died, but she did have a sister and brother in Italy, who, along with their entire families, were invited, all expenses paid. There were even a few distant cousins. The 200 attendees grew to a little over 400, all expenses paid. I ended up renting a couple of floors at one of the beach hotels. I don't even want to talk about the cost. You guys know the routine. I wasn't allowed to do anything concerning the wedding dress except pay for it. Both Bella and Gina accompanied me to pick out the tuxedos. I was under the impression that all I had to do was basically pick one. What was I wrong? Let me tell you, Gina and Bella spent all afternoon making sure my outfit was perfect. They almost drove the tailor to a nervous breakdown with all their changes. I'm just glad it was a black tuxedo with a white shirt. Just think what would have happened if I had wanted a colored shirt, or heaven forbid, a pattern one. I'd probably still be in the store. All I can say is, when Bella gets married, I'm going on a year-long around-the-world cruise ending the day before the wedding. I'm not going to be around for all that planning, I just couldn't stand the stress. I'm just going to leave the American Express card. Every time Keanu walked by me, he just laughed. I told him I was going to fire him after the wedding, and he just laughed even harder. The big day finally arrived. I wasn't allowed in my own house the few days before. I ended up staying in the hotel with all of Gina's relatives. They turned out to be a really fun bunch. Between my broken Italian and their broken English, and my credit card, we got along famously. There I was, standing in front of the makeshift altar with the priest when this beautiful vision in white started down the aisle, with the bridal party leading the way. She was my soon-to-be wife, Gina. The rest of the afternoon was a blur. I remember saying I do, I remember the reception, and I remember everyone congratulating me. Most of all, I remember the wedding night. That night, we started on making a baby, but Gina had been on the pill, and it took almost five months before it took. Gina and I were gone three weeks on our honeymoon. 
she took me to her homeland and showed me the land of her birth. Italy is a beautiful country, and every night was special. I hated to leave and return home to normal, if you can call living in Hawaii normal. I really don't know who was happier between the three of us. All I know is that Bella helped pick out everything for the baby's room, helped send out shower invitations, and accompanied Gina on all her visits to the OB. Gina did draw the line at the labor room, only I was allowed in there. It was a beautiful May afternoon when Giorgio Douglas entered the world at 8.3 pounds, a very healthy baby boy. When Bella was allowed in the room, the first thing she did was visit her new brother. Hi, Giorgio. I'm your big sister. Welcome to our home. The nurse picked the baby up and let Bella hold him for just a moment before giving him to his mom to start feeding. Bella watched everything Gina did with the baby. Bella had discovered the miracle of life and started to realize her place in it. The wait in the hospital worked out to be two days before Gina and her son could leave. I think they were the longest two days in Bella's life. Bella had arranged to take the day off from school and was up and dressed at dawn. She supervised Keanu as he installed the baby seat, arranged the placement of the diaper bag, and, of course, picked out all the baby toys. She lectured Keanu on keeping to the speed limit, avoiding potholes, and general safe driving procedures. She informed him, you are driving my brother home. I knew I had to give him a bonus at Christmas for his patience. Bella had plans to show her brother all the sights on their way home. Unfortunately, he slept the entire time. Anyone who has raised children knows that for the first few months, a child just eats, sleeps, and goes through diapers. Bella spent all her free time watching her brother and asking Gina all sorts of questions. If I wanted to visit with Bella, I had to pick her brother up and leave the room, followed as if on a leash. I still remember when Giorgio was about three or four months old and recognized his sister, giving her a big toothless grin. Bella was hooked from that point on, she was his perfect big sister. When Bella's friends came over, they were subjected to tales of Giorgio's accomplishments, but being girls, they loved it. It was cute to see all the girls watching whenever he needed a diaper change, and it was even funnier when one or two of the girls got showered during the changing. They all complained, but it took another year before anything of note happened. Gina and Bella had their annual physicals, and when they returned, Bella was a very quiet little girl. She and Gina disappeared into Bella's bedroom with a pamphlet the doctor had given her. I guess Gina was going to tell Bella the facts of life. Dads were not invited to these discussions. They spent the time until dinner in Bella's bedroom, but when they sat down to dinner, Bella was acting like her old self. Gina held my hand through the meal but gave me that we'll talk later look. We did talk later. Gina explained everything she, Bella, and the OBGYN discussed. The outcome of our talk was that I was to keep my mouth shut and not embarrass Bella. I guess there are things fathers can't know concerning their daughters. About a week later, the doctor's office called. We were to bring Bella in for some additional tests. No big deal, just to check on some things. The nurse gave us a series of appointments at the hospital and the lab. The end result of all the tests was that Bella had leukemia. We had a family visit with an oncologist. The man was full of hope and good news. He used phrases like we caught it early, a bone marrow transplant, and a little chemotherapy is all that's required, and most importantly, she'll live a long and productive life. I was worried about finding a bone marrow donor because of our non-blood relationship, but we got lucky, Bella had a very common bone marrow type, and a match was no problem. Many of Bella's friends volunteered to be tested as donors. While none of them were used, it made Bella very proud of her friends. When it came time for the transplant, Gina and I practically lived at the hospital. Bella received cards and letters from all her classmates. The bone marrow transplant was a success, but the oncologist wanted to continue chemotherapy just in case. Bella was a sick little girl, her hair fell out. Gina and I shaved our heads too. The three of us made quite a sight. Bella picked out headscarves for Gina and me and the girls' scarves looked good on them. Mine had a weird pattern and color, 
my girls would look at me and snicker. I knew I'd been set up, but if it helped Bella, I didn't care. One day, I received a phone call from the school. They wanted me to bring Bella in for a homecoming rally. When the date of the rally arrived, Gina and I escorted Bella into the school's gym. Imagine my surprise when we walked in and found ourselves facing about 200 bald teenagers. Her class had decided to show their support by shaving their heads. Bella was weak but held onto my arm and smiled from ear to ear. The kids chanted her name over and over again. Bella and Gina cried. Well, let's just say I must have gotten something in my eyes because they watered freely. About a year after that first meeting with the oncologist, we received the good news. The doctor said the chemotherapy had worked and Bella was cancer-free. She could start high school in the fall as a freshman. We were a very happy family that night. I overheard Bella telling her three-year-old brother that she'd be around to help him grow up. I cried my eyes out later. I never realized that Bella had been contemplating death while dealing with her cancer. Bella and her brother were inseparable. If you found one, you usually found the other. It got so bad that Gina and I enrolled him in preschool. This allowed Giorgio to tell his sister all about his day at school. Gina and I watched in amazement as the two siblings developed a special bond. The years flew by, and Gina and I grew closer. I guess Bella's sickness was the catalyst. We behaved like an old married couple. By that, I mean our lovemaking dropped off to once or twice a week. We didn't sit on the couch and cuddle every night, only on those nights. Bella's sophomore and junior years passed quickly. Soon, we were discussing colleges. In Hawaii, there aren't a lot of choices, so we expanded our search to the mainland. We searched the West Coast and the Ivy Leagues on the East Coast. Bella decided that she really didn't want to leave home, so she elected to apply to Brigham Young University Hawaii, BYU. It was a beautiful campus next to the Polynesian Cultural Center. It was during the Christmas holidays that I noticed Bella wasn't her normal cheerful self. I chalked it up to the strain of the holidays and selecting a college. Well, you can imagine my surprise when the school called. Bella had collapsed and was taken to the emergency room. The doctors poked and prodded the poor kid, keeping her overnight. Gina, Giorgio, and I slept in her room at the hospital that night. The next morning, her old oncologist visited her and kept ordering tests throughout the day. That night, he sat us all down. All he said was, it's back. Gina collapsed, and I managed to catch her before she hit the floor. Giorgio ran from the room, wanting to be alone with his fear. Me? I just walked over to Bella's bed and started talking to her. We'll beat it again. They will have new medicines. You'll be ready to graduate this spring. Before I knew it, the doctor took my arm and shook his head, saying no. She has about four months. There's nothing we can do. It's just too far advanced. Gina collapsed again. I felt Bella's arms go around me from behind as she said, Just hold me, Poppy. My daughter and I had a good cry. Bella didn't make the doctor's promised four months. She left us one night, about three months later, with Gina and me holding her, while Giorgio held Bella's great big teddy bear at the foot of her bed, tears rolling down his cheeks. The funeral was a solemn affair. Most of her senior class showed up at the gravesite, carrying simple lays of white flowers. Most of them ended up decorating her coffin. I'll admit it, I blubbered like a fool. My little girl was gone. That night, I had my first dream. It was of a little girl with beautiful eyes watching me at Starbucks. I couldn't get those eyes to go away. I got out of bed and opened a bottle from my bar. I sat on the couch and finished the bottle. It helped me sleep that night. One morning, before I started on a new bottle, I saw Alani watching me with a disapproving expression on her face. It helps me forget her. It helps with the pain. It will only be for a little while, I explained. She looked at me and said, You've been drunk for the last six months. Then Alani hit me right between the eyes. Your wife and son have left you. They have gone back to Italy. 
They won't return until you're sober. It took a few minutes for my brain to process it, but it finally sank in. I resolved to start sobering up. I got up from the chair and opened another bottle. I'd start tomorrow, or maybe the next day. But by Friday, I was checking in for detox. Then the plan was a visit to Italy to reclaim my family, just like Bella would want her poppy to do. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.